Every politician, when he leaves office, ought to go straight to jail and serve his time. American Folk Saying. All right, welcome to another episode of Liberty Dad Podcast, a discussion on politics and culture. This episode is pre-recorded to accommodate schedules between Mrs. Kalinich and I. Nevertheless, if you're watching, then I appreciate you tuning in. It's election season and time to get back into candidate interviews. Thursdays are the designated day. My goal, interview as many candidates as I can for any seat in any state. I'll do my best to have as many live as possible at 7 a.m. Eastern, but sometimes that's just a little too early for some, and so we have to pre-record them. With that said, let's bring Erica on. Erica, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Very well. Thank you for joining me, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be a little distracted here. I almost forgot to uh, just have a little thing at the bottom that says this is pre-recorded so that people don't you know, start putting in comments. Uh, so let me, let me get that punched out really quickly here. All right, there we go. So, so now people know, like if they put in a comment, we won't be responding to them. So let's get right into this. So you're out of West Virginia. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Well, my name is Erica Kalenich. I am the Libertarian candidate for governor here in West Virginia in 2024. I am a lawyer, an entrepreneur, a mom, a wife, and just a West Virginia gal who wants to see change here in West Virginia. This is my second time running. Mm -hmm. I ran in 2020. It was my first time running in 2020. I went big the first time. I ran for governor the first time I've ever run for anything. It's the ballot access race for the Libertarian Party. But, you know, separate and apart from that, it's the one chance I think I have to educate West Virginians about liberty and really make a change here in West Virginia. So that's what I'm doing. So when you say, so last time you, you ran for the first time and then you're running again, yeah. what really got you motivated to say, not only am I going to run, but I'm going to run for governor? Sure. <laughs> um, I guess right place, right time or wrong place, right time, as it <laughs> were. You know, I, in West Virginia, we're always at the top of all, all the bad lists and the bottom of all the good lists. And everybody always knows that, you know, from West Virginia, we just, we just take that on the cheek and we always roll with it. And it's kind of something, you know, we West Virginians joke about is, you know, everybody always makes fun of West Virginia, but West Virginia is a place that really has heart, but everybody leaves. And that's something that's always kind of got to me, you know, all my friends leave. And I wanted to run for an office. If, if, if I was going to, jump into politics. And maybe we'll talk about this later, but politics is awful. It's terrifying. I don't love it. It's not mm -hmm. where the person that I naturally am pulls toward. But mm -hmm. if I was going to jump into politics, I wanted to do something where I really felt like I could change the state and change this narrative that people in West Virginia have to leave. And I was one of those people. I always you know, tell people when I grew up, my mom raised me on a bartender salary mm -hmm. and I never associated poverty with lack of hard work because my mom worked very, very hard. Right. So I associated poverty with West Virginia. Okay. And I think a lot of people do. And we're taught as kids here in, in this state and, you know, certainly with my generation and still that success is leaving and mm -hmm. it, we have this massive exodus of youth from our state and you start to see how that affects the economy and then how that affects people who stay here and i thought this is something i really have a passion for i really want to change and the only way that i can really effectuate change in that is by being governor of this state 
And if I'm not going to be governor of this state, I mean, my goal is always to win. But if I'm not going to win, then I'm going to spread the message through West Virginia that it doesn't have to be this way. There mm -hmm. are other options. And, you know, poverty poverty isn't because of lack of hard work. And you don't have to leave West Virginia to find success. Gotcha. So when you mentioned, you mentioned a moment ago that, well, actually, let me back up. Sure. Because you said that a, a lot of people leave West Virginia. Yeah. Do you find that as they get older, they ever come back? Or is it like once they're gone, they, bye? Some people come back, but mm -hmm. not enough people come back. Okay. You know, we have a we have a dying population in West Virginia. And there, there are occasionally people who come back. We've actually had some success with COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, once... <laughs> one good thing that came out of COVID and I don't give it credit for much, but right. one of the good things that did come is we realized people can work from anywhere. You know, companies realize that remote work is a possibility. We changed that a little bit in the mindset of companies and corporations and West Virginia and all it has to offer in terms of its landscapes, you know, it, it's beautiful outdoors type activities. People have really started to move into the state and some of those are people that have left, but not at the speed that they need to. You know, I left for a little bit, not not a long time, you know, four or five years. So some people do come back. Not enough, not a lot. Gotcha. And then I have a question about your ballot access. Yeah. Um, what, because I know that states have different issues with ballot access. So mm -hmm. what are the challenges that the Libertarian Party faces in West Virginia when it comes to ballot? Because you said you're running partially to help with the ballot access. Correct. Um, you know, I feel like we have it pretty bad, but then I talk to people from other states and I realize we have it really good. We just have to get 1% in the gubernatorial mm -hmm. election. We have maintained ballot access consistently since uh, 2012. 2012, the Libertarian Party did a petitioning effort uh, David Moran ran for governor. He mm -hmm. got ballot access. He got the 1% when he petitioned to get on the ballot in 12. He maintained it in 2016. When I ran in 2020, you know, I got more than the 1%. So we, we've we done pretty well. We actually have almost 1% of registered voters in West Virginia. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. The the challenge that we have, I think, and the risk that we have with ballot access is getting all of those libertarians out to vote. And I think within the Libertarian Party, taking for granted that we're always going to have it. Mm. Once it starts to seem easy, folks don't want to work as hard. You, right. you know, and, and then it starts to seem like, oh, don't worry. You know, anybody can run. We're always going to get it. It's OK. And then it starts to slip away a little bit. So that right. would maybe be my fear for the future. But right now we're doing well. Good, good. Uh, yes. And one percent is actually like, I mean, it's still a challenge yes. because you have to get. Now, is that one percent uh, governor or any state level? Has um, to be specific. the governor's race. Oh, oh, it has to be the governor's race. Okay. Yes. Um, and then do you have it? Like, is there any backup with like, say the presidential as some other states have? No. Okay. So your race. only option is the governor race. So you guys actually right. have to run a governor candidate. If we you do. want to maintain that. Okay. Got it. We do. Um, okay. And you know, I, I think that 1%, especially like last time, it looks like you got 2.9%. So yes. you actually got almost three times what you needed. Um, you know, and that's your first time running, yeah. you know, it, as they, as I've heard before, the first time you run, you're running to kind of build name recognition. And then the second time you run, you run to win or something along that line. Um, but basically you're trying to get people to, to, to realize who you are. So what has been the reception from the party overall? Like, have they been, let me, I don't want to put you in a tough spot. Um, have you, have you found a lot of support, you know, or is it still kind of like we could do better people just kind of like you said a moment ago, they get a little complacent because, hey, we've been we've had ballot access, I believe you said, since 2012. So 
you know, it's always someone else will take care of it, right? Like that's a very common attitude, not just with the Libertarian Party, just anywhere. You know, I've had a lot of support this year. Mm -hmm. I've been very surprised. A lot of volunteers, a lot of donors, a lot of support. Could it always be better? Yes. Does it mainly come from leadership and, you know, the same people that are always involved in the party? It does. Mm -hmm. Um, I do find it encouraging, though. There seems to be a lot of energy out there this year amongst people that I'm meeting on the campaign trail. We're getting a lot more people than I would have expected saying, hey, how can I help? How can I sign up? How can I get involved in your campaign? And and that has been quite pleasing to me. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am quite pleased with the amount of help that I've been getting. I mean, it's always been better, right? You always want to be able to say, when I'm setting up the booth at the state fair for two weeks, I've got a solid, you know, three volunteers for every day. We're right. not there yet, but... I'm happy with where we are. Gotcha. Um, so help me to understand the challenges that you face, because when I think of West Virginia, I don't actually think poor. So, I mean, I don't know if that helps out any at all in the feeling, <laughs> but I do think like very mountainous and very rural er, rural area. So I imagine that makes it very difficult to, to knock doors because you stop and maybe, you know, I, my feeling is, you know, just from passing through, that there are some cities, but there's an awful lot of distance in between homes that you've got to go out and reach out to people. Correct. So, what is, so, so I guess I should ask a question. So how does that affect your campaigning when you're out trying to talk to people, you know, shake hands, kiss babies and all that? Right. So the campaigning that we do has to mainly be done through events. You know, West Virginia is a huge fairs and festivals type mm -hmm. state. That's really where you can meet people is at the fairs and festivals. You're correct. There are a few cities. Um, there are a few small towns where you can do door knocking efforts. It is, it is hard though, because you do have a lot of rural counties where in order to door knock, you're, you're driving between homes, right? You're not walking. Um, the maps are hard because, because, you know, we only recently within the past few years have gotten 911 addressing. So okay. a lot of the addresses are going to be difficult to find with the GPS. And we don't, I guess earlier when I said, you know, we have a lot of volunteers and they're great. You know, we are like a mighty army of 15. Okay. So we certainly don't have, you know, the capacity to do a lot of things like door knocking. So we do have to convince condense our efforts and go to events where we know there are already going to be hundreds or thousands of people. So West Virginia is a difficult place to, to do the types of things you would do in a typical campaign or in a campaign, maybe in a larger area or a city. And then the, the thing that makes it maybe even more difficult is, you know, I know that the, you know, the Democrats and Republicans always spend a lot of money there's an astronomical amount of money in West Virginia spent in campaigns, mm -hmm. given the size of our state. It's, I mean, the amount of money that political action committees, industries like, you know, coal is very big in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that they spend dumping into the election is, is insane. Now I will say the benefit that I've had is that the, once the Republican primary was over, the Republican stopped running. The Democrat has never really started. So I'm really the only person out there campaigning. So that that has actually been a benefit to me when we're out at these fairs and festivals and events. I'm the only candidate who's there. Gotcha. So I will take that as a positive. Okay. And what's the reception like from people like when they're when they're meeting a libertarian, maybe for the the second or third or whatever time, or maybe even the first time and you're telling them about, you know, cause I'm sure they ask you like, oh, what's a libertarian, mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do for me? Those kind of questions. What's their reception like when you talk to them? It's been very, very good. And, and I'm not just saying that <laughs> I'm right. not just saying that to be, you know, Hey, things are all sunshine, sunshine and rainbows out there. It's been amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I campaigned in 2020, I mean, West Virginia is a very red state. 
it is, it's definitely, you know, Trump territory. Mm -hmm. And when I campaigned in 2020, I would often, you know, be out there and people would just, I mean, they were nasty, right? They would just scream Trump at me. Um, it wouldn't even listen to what I would say. They're just like right. Trump, you know, in my face this year, people are very inquisitive. They're like, okay. Oh my gosh, you know, what is this? Who are you? What is libertarian? Tell me about this. We need something else. And they will listen. Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of the events I go to are very much just, I, I'm sure there's a more polished political term for it, you know, uh, amongst you know my campaign team, we just call it renegade campaigning, where we'll mm -hmm. just go to an event without a booth or a table, a bunch of cards, you know, mm -hmm. our campaign gear on, and we just walk out. Hey, I'm Eric. I'm running for governor. I'm going to be on the ballot in November. I'd like to talk to you. Can I give you my card? You know, what do you care about? And the amount of people that are willing to talk to me mm -hmm. and not blow me off, and the amount of people that don't say no. You know, I think I could probably count on one hand this summer, the amount of people who, who have said, no, thank you, ma'am. And wow. the people that have said, no, thank you have done it in a friendly way. It's been gotcha. really amazing. Is, is that, do you think it's because like right now the news and, you know, everybody seems to be frustrated with the two candidates that we got, yeah. you know, they're almost a million years old. And I think people are just worn out with both of them on many levels. Is that contributing to the, the better reception this time around? I, I think it has to be. I think it has to be. And that that is carrying over to, you know, into West Virginia. You know, our, our Republican candidate is just, you know, he's a kind of a, a rubber stamp for Trump. You know, he advertises okay. himself that way. I'm, I'm a Donald Trump kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, and I, I say this with, you know, a, a lot of respect that the Democratic candidate in our state for governor is just completely absent. He is gotcha. nowhere to be seen. And, and I think people know that. Gotcha. So I want to talk about your prior election really quickly. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, your prior uh, candidacy yeah. um, back in 2020. So I'm going to pull up the results, if you don't mind. Sure. And, and this isn't a shame or anything like that. We yeah. just want to talk about them. And uh, so it looks like what you've got here is, um, uh, just in case anybody cannot see that on the screen, we've got Jim Justice, who was the Republican, got 63.5%. Ben Salengo, I think, 30%. Uh, um, you got 2.9%. I'm going to skip the right in, but the uh, the Mountain Party, which I have a question for you in a few moments. Sure. Daniel Lutz, he got 1.4%. So my question to you is, it's very simple. Because that was your first election and now you're, or I'm sorry, I keep saying election because that was your first <laughs> run. Yeah. And then this is your second. What, um, what did you do that you would do? What's the best thing that you did and what would you do differently or what are you doing differently? Well, you know, I think, I think the best thing that I did was being an inexperienced candidate, I just quickly pivoted, you know, mm -hmm. when the world shut down because of COVID and my plan, which was, you know, the fairs and festivals, walk main streets of small towns, got crushed. I just thought, you know, what, what can I do? And I took to the first thing I knew of, which was social media. And mm -hmm. I just tried my best, you know, I gathered all my friends and we just ran the most aggressive social media campaign that we could. And then I just put together my own little tour into towns. Mm -hmm. I would just go set up on, you know, main streets in towns that I knew would let me. And I, that turned out really well for me, just thinking creatively and out of the box is what I would say the best thing was that I did in 2020. Um, I am doing a lot of things differently this year. I think, you know, just having, just having a head start having a head start on all of your everything. I, I think when I ran in 2020, one of the things I underestimated was how quickly people would want things like yard signs, t-shirts, mm -hmm. buttons, uh, you know, coming into this campaign, I knew all of that and right. jumping on those things. And those things are really important to people. The person who, ask you for a button and you're able to hand it to them right away is the person who becomes your volunteer and then, you know, shows up to the event and donates to your campaign. 
I think the other thing that I've done this year is I pretty aggressively started fundraising right from the get go. And I I did okay with fundraising the first time, Um, you know, but better than I think some candidates do, but I started aggressively fundraising um, straight, you know, straight from the time that I planned on running this time. And I think I was a new libertarian when I ran Mm -hmm. in 2020. And I don't want to say that my message was watered down, but Mm -hmm. I was probably more scared Mm -hmm. about talking to people about liberty and what that meant than I am now. Gotcha. And I think it probably took me until, you know, maybe October the last time before I was really in my stride of Mm -hmm. saying, you know, no, I mean, legalize all drugs, including heroin. That's exactly what I mean. It just took me, it took me a little bit to, you know, be able to talk that aggressively. And this time I've been able to talk that way from day one. Okay. Awesome. That's, you know, I think that's good. I, and I, I like to hear, you know, and hopefully other people do. I like to hear stories where people are like, Hey, look, you know, I learned this and I grew, I grew and I'm ready to come back and hit it harder. Right. Because yeah. I think the libertarian party, they really need people that, uh, that take a moment for introspection and just say, okay, what did I do wrong or not so well? And what did I do that was great? And, you know, let me, let me utilize this experience so that next time around, instead of two point, what was it, two, I think it was 2.9%. You know, maybe it's, you know, four or five percent. Right. And then yeah. really set that bar high. Um, plus, I mean, we all love that kind of story. Right. We, we would love to see the numbers double. So I think, you know, um, good, good for you. Good on you. Um, so you were talking a moment ago about all the money that's um, that's in the, that the Republicans, and the Democrats and boy, you are not lying. So here is here's what we have. Um, I did my research, by the way. Um, so these are your, these are your, uh, these are your opponents right now, at least the ones that are listed on Ballotpedia. Um, and this looks like the major parties. So correct me if I made any mistakes here. Um, but it looks like the Democrat, uh, has raised 31,000 according to, uh, the, the, the state of what, you know, according to the most current receipts, uh, the Republican Patrick Morrissey, $3 million, three and a half million dollars. Um, you have 11,000 and then comparable actually to the mountain party, which was 10,000, uh, 10 and a half thousand. So I'm curious, uh, I've got a couple of questions based on this. Um, sure. usually this is the first time that I've seen a, a libertarian, uh, candidate compared to another third party that, that appears equivalent, at least in the fundraising and, and that it's kind of up there. I mean, if, if you see like two third party candidates and they have a thousand dollars each, like, okay, I got it. But like 10 and 11, I, w- I was, I, that really caught my attention. Is the mountain party comparable or they just, or did they just happen to raise a fair amount of money? Oh, that's a good question, sir. Uh, <laughs> I would say they just happened to raise a comparable amount of money. So the, okay. the mountain party is West Virginia's equivalent of the green party. Okay. I, I don't know why they're called something in West different in West Virginia, but that's, that's basically what they are. Okay. Gotcha. They, they tend to run hot or cold depending on who their particular candidate is. They're not, they're not necessarily as well organized in the state of West Virginia as the Libertarian Party. They okay. don't have as much membership or reg- voter registration as Libertarian Party. They're not growing as much as the Libertarian Party. I-, I think you just have a particular candidate there who's done particularly well fundraising. Gotcha. Okay. I didn't realize they were equivalent to the to the Green Party. Yeah. Um, I, I think th- I, I'm not even sure the status of the Green Party here in Florida. I think they may be, I think since COVID, if I heard correctly, they actually kind of got even more scattered a little bit because I I don't think they could agree on uh, some of the 
uh, on some of their positions on COVID policies. <laughs> so I think that fractured them a little bit more, uh, at least from what I've heard. Uh, so, so do you have a plan to compete or, or what is your plan to compete with the Republicans and Democrats? And this is really the, this is a challenge for every libertarian ever, right? Because we know that the, the Republicans and the Democrats, they just can raise a buttload of money and it's in every state, just practically any race. Uh, I saw it here in Jacksonville when we ran city council candidates, you know, you had people that were raising millions of dollars and we were excited to get, you know, to raise like five, 10, $15,000 or whatever, you know, whatever the amount was for our candidates. And so like, how, what is your plan to, to take what you've got? And I don't want to diminish what you've got either. Um, but what's your plan to kind of be that underdog and fight that underdog fight? Sure. Well, you know, the first thing is that we know we just have to work 10 times as hard as mm -hmm. the other two candidates. And, you know, as I mentioned, they're not out there. The, the interesting thing was, you know, Steve Williams, who's the Democratic candidate, he is the current mayor of Huntington. Mm -hmm. The largest city in West Virginia is Charleston. Okay. They held a pride event. I was in the parade, marched in the parade with, you know, people have my signs and he wasn't there. Hmm. <laughs> it was kind of astronomical. Huntington is maybe a half hour from Charleston. Everybody I met that day, I gave out probably over a thousand, over a thousand, you know, cards and, you know, little packets of information. Everybody that I met there said, you will now have my vote because the Democratic candidate didn't care enough to show up. Good. So Patrick Morrissey, who's the Republican candidate, presumes that he's won. So he's done trying. He's okay. not coming out to meet people, even though he only got slightly. Um, I forget exactly what his percentage was in the Republican primary, but not enough that you should presume that all those Republicans who voted against you are mm -hmm. about to come vote for you. Like, I, I certainly wouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think he's going to drop the ball and there's a lot at play there. And West Virginia is becoming, you know, the, the people that are registering as nonpartisan or independent is growing. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party is falling, especially with Joe Manchin, you know, our West Virginia senator switching to independent. And, you know, we actually believe that we have a chance to do significantly better mm -hmm. um, or at least equal to the Democrats based on the shift of what's happening in terms of the voter registration. So there was a poll out recently, actually by a, a local newspaper that talked about, you know, there's some, I'm not sure if you've heard this, but there's some buzz about whether or not Joe Manchin will enter the West Virginia governor's race as an independent okay. because he, he has one more term that he could be governor. And he ironically switched to independent the, the last day that you would have to switch to independent to be able to run okay, um, as an independent. So everybody's been running polls. There's been polling, like, what would you, you know, if Joe Manchin gets in the race, who are you voting for? And mm -hmm. I polled just 1% under Patrick Morrissey and Joe Manchin got 19%. Patrick Morrissey got 34 or 35 and I got 34 and the democratic candidate was like at 11. Gotcha. So the democratic party's dead. And I now think, you know, I'm competing for that, you know, 20% that's clearly a strong independent streak in mm -hmm. West Virginia. So I think I just have to work hard to go out, find those people, message to them and meet them. You know, mm -hmm. so many people are excited when they meet me out there. And, and I think that that's what it's going to take is actual face-to-face -face meetings, campaigning, mm -hmm. old-fashioned style, because so many people now, they, they raise that money that you were talking about, right? And so then they just throw it into TV ads. And mm -hmm. I think that is starting to turn people off because most of the time the ads are negative, mm -hmm. which plays into the polarization, which right. people are becoming increasingly impatient with. So when I'm out there actually on the streets with people, and I'm saying, hey, I'm just a normal West Virginia girl. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not out here as much, you know, Monday through Thursday 
because I actually own a business. I got 40 families, you know, that depend on me to run my mm -hmm. business and feed, but I'm out here on the weekend. I want to meet you. I want to meet your family and I want to know what you care about. I, I think I'm really getting to people that way. And then those people are going home and they're telling their friends and their family, oh my goodness, you won't believe what happened today. I actually met somebody who's running for governor and they were, they were down at the coal festival. Like right. I, I got some stuff here. You should really check them out. And I, I think that that's how I'm going to do it is just working harder and actually meeting people as opposed to just throwing ads on TV that pretty soon people are going to start ignoring. Right. So it's interesting. I, I looked it up. It looks like the, um, the democratic candidate, Steve Williams, uh, he just straight up won the primary, uh, with a hundred percent. And then as you pointed out, Patrick Morrissey, he won the Republican primary, but he won 33.3% with more Capito coming in at 27.6%. So he really, and, and then Chris Miller had 20.4%, Mac Warner had 16%. So, I mean, there was quite a, quite a divide there um, in the top four. And so taking all of that in, and it looks like there's no incumbent this year. Correct. And from what I could tell, it looks like historically it's, it's kind of goes on and off Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. Um, what, is there a particular party that you find is more sympathetic to libertarians or, or is it just people that you meet and, and sometimes they're Democrats, sometimes they're Republican? Well, there are just less Democrats in West Virginia in general. Um, okay. most of them have converted to, you know, the Republican party, the West Virginia was very democratic until, you know, until Barack Obama, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, his stance on coal. And then they, they all became Republican. West Virginia was only democratic because they that. were, they were union coal folk. And then they became Republican union coal folk. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting you ask. Um, that's always, you know, the libertarian question, right? Like, where, where, where are our folks coming from? Are they coming from the left? Or are they coming from the right? Um, I think right now in West Virginia, we have a lot of folks that are probably going to come from the right. Mm -hmm. A lot of liberty-minded people that are thinking, "Hey, wait a second. You know, West Virginia had been run by the Democrats forever." And now we have a Republican supermajority and they were supposed to cut the taxes. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to give us a little bit of freedom. They were supposed to cut the governor's emergency powers after, you know, he did all these, you know, lockdowns because of COVID. We were supposed to get some sort of, you know, shift toward liberty and freedom with the Republican supermajority, and none of that happened. We're basically still the same state that we were under Democratic leadership. I think that that's probably where a lot of a, a lot of my support is going to come from. Gotcha. And you mentioned Obama. Remind me, was West Virginia the cling to guns and 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 God comment? Was was that the state that he said that about? I don't know. I, I know he said it and it was, you know, I mean, it's, it was like what, 2008, something like that. So it's quite a while ago, but I know that he said that. And I want to say it was, I want to say it was West Virginia, but I just can't remember. I remember there was a huge kerfluffle. Uh, I'm just going to, I can't help, but look it up while we're talking here. So I wonder if it was, that would be uh, interesting. Uh, let's, let's, let's just take a um, cling to guns and God, I believe it was. So let's see what, let's see what we got here. Um, let's see, where was he? Angers Midwest voters with guns and religion. Oh, he was like guns and religion. So let's see here. Ah, ads all over. Um, okay. So let's see. Obama was caught in an uncharacteristic moment of loose language, referring to working class voters in old industrial towns decimated, decimated by job losses. He said they get better, they cling to guns or religion or antith antipathy to people who aren't like them or anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations. But I'm not seeing, let's see here. Um, I don't see where it was. I just see that they're referencing how people in other states took it. So I guess it wasn't. I guess it wasn't in West Virginia. Okay. 
I, I think he just said it in general about middle class okay. Americans, um, and more specifically rural Americans. So that's what made me think it might have been West Virginia, but it's been a while. Okay, let's let's talk about your issues. So you know, um, what are the issues? What are they when you're talking to people? What and you're saying, hey, what are the issues that you care about? What are they telling you? People care a lot in West Virginia about children. Okay. And, and that makes sense, right? Because we're talking mm -hmm. about kids that grow up and leave the state. And so what we have going on in West Virginia with kids is, is really is twofold education and foster care. We have a okay. big foster care crisis in West Virginia. So believe it or not, 60% of kids in West Virginia are being raised by somebody other than their biological parents, wow. 60%. So wow. whether or not that's, you know, aunt, uncle, family members, uh, foster care. You um, mean other than both of their biological parents, correct? No, or, I don't. So, oh, okay. I mean someone other than their any, either of their biological parents. Oh, okay. So it could be like their mom and then a stepdad or something like that? No. Is that what you're saying? Oh, you, you mean no mom, not their biological mom, not their biological dad, somebody else outside of that. Okay. Somebody else. Wow. So grandparents, wow. aunt, uncle foster care, cousin, older sister that got custody mm -hmm. of them. I mean, they don't have biological mom or biological dad raising them. What is 60%. the cause? What's, what's the cause? Do you, I mean, is it like, I, I can't even begin to guess. Substance abuse. Okay. And an over eager state that removes children based on substance abuse. Okay. So um, let's, let's clarify that because sure. and I don't want anybody to be misled here and say like, Hey, how can you say over aggressive and substance abuse at the same time? Um, so I assume that when you say a substance abuse, you're talking anything from a single marijuana joint or something like that to like maybe heroin or something, you know, much stronger, correct? Anything, I'm, any of that? I'm talking about all things. Okay. I'm talking about you know, CPS, um, first of all, let me say this, you know, CPS in West Virginia, I think most 90% of the CPS workers do their best. However, they don't have good guidance. They're under trained. They're overworked. It's just a bad, bad thing. Mm -hmm. You'll have cases where, I mean, we've liter literally had court cases where CPS will get a referral about children locked in sheds that don't get investigated in one county. And then over here, you'll have, you know, child came to school with a dirty t-shirt on, teacher makes a referral to CPS, child came to school, seemed tired, had a dirty shirt, CPS goes to the home, house seems dirty, parent seems uncooperative, glassy eyes. What's that? Marijuana cigarette removal. Gotcha. Just not an equal playing field. And then the rules kind of surrounding what, what happens once the kids get removed, very arbitrary time frames. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole just to say that it's it it's very hard to get your kids back once they're removed unless you do a hundred percent what the state wants you to there are arbitrary time frames let's say you are somebody with a substance abuse problem and you want to recover the state tells you exactly the time frame by statute that you have to recover in and if your recovery is not on that time frame mm -hmm. your kids are your rights to your kids are permanently terminated it, it's just a system that needs a lot of work gotcha so as governor then how would you how would you uh, move forward trying to resolve that? I know that you don't have a magic wand. If you were elected governor, you'd have to work with your state legislature. But what are, what kind of ideas do you have that would help improve this situation? Well, I, I think the first thing is that probably need to just clarify what a, what abuse and neglect is. Mm -hmm. If it's severe enough that your kids need removed in 90% of situations, you should probably be in jail. 
I mean, okay. that, that should probably be, you know, that is a child abuse or neglect situation where you should probably be in jail. If you don't need to be in jail, then probably your children don't need to be removed. And maybe there just needs to be more institutions of safety plans. Most of these cases, there are grandparents, by the way, that the kids end up with that the grandparents, if CPS asked, would step in and say, hey, yes, I'll make sure the child's clean. I'll make sure the child gets to school until, you know, dad can go to rehab or get himself clean. Um, many times the, you know, the person who had the marijuana cigarette is, is somebody who's going to work. House was fine. Maybe the kid just had a stained up t-shirt he wanted to wear that day to school. So there's also an issue that CPS maybe has too much latitude. And a lot of the judges in West Virginia are just removing the children. So I would, again, I'm only the governor. I can't force the legislature to right. do anything, but right. I would strongly encourage the legislature to talk to the guardian ad litems and the people that are on the ground, the attorneys that are involved in these cases and rewrite the abuse and neglect code so that there's not so much authority placed within CPS to arbitrarily remove children and make decisions on behalf of these families. Gotcha. You ready for the tough question then? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, on that same note, libertarians, we believe in decriminalizing drugs. Yeah. Uh, most of us, uh, all drugs, every mm -hmm. single one of them. So now you just said that, hey, there is on some level a drug problem in the state of West Virginia. Um, and sometimes it's a problem in quotations, right? Like, okay, somebody's smoking some marijuana, but they're otherwise a good citizen and they're not causing any problems and they generally take care of their kid pretty well. So it's not really an issue, but then you may have somebody who's using some harder drugs and, you know, they, they def, there's definitely a problem there. So what is your message in general as a governor candidate to say, uh, you know, regarding drugs and regarding the libertarian position when you have, because when people hear 60%, I'm willing to bet that most people don't go, yeah, I bet a lot of those are probably not legit. I mean, maybe they do, but I, I tend to think that when people just hear a number like that, they think, wow, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And when and 60% doesn't sound like it's time to decriminalize drugs. That just doesn't. It, so what's your message to, to, po to folks that may be concerned that it would make the problem worse? Well, when we focus on punishing people who are addicts, mm -hmm. as opposed to focusing on ways to allow them to recover, mm -hmm. we, it's dangerous because we distract ourselves from the real issue, which is why are people in West Virginia addicts? And we don't get to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing in West Virginia now is increasing penalties, increasing penalties, increasing penalties. And as we've been doing that, what happens? Overdose, 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 overdose. Mm -hmm. And I, I had this conversation with somebody on Saturday that during the era of prohibition, people were making gin in bathtubs mm -hmm. and it had a lot of bacteria and it would make you sick. Probably if you were drinking bathtub gin, you probably got sick. Okay. And back then if you looked at, if I looked at you and I said, I think we should decriminalize gin, you would say, are you crazy? And if I said to you, I bet if we did, companies would just make gin and it would be safe and you could just get it down at the corner store and like guys would just drink it after work and go to work next day and take mm -hmm. care of their kids. Right. You would think I was a monster. And you might feel that same way now if I'm telling you that meth was the same way. Mm -hmm. If we decriminalize meth and you picked it up at Walmart on your way home, it would be a lot safer. It right. wouldn't have the stuff in it that made it as addictive, but would still make it maybe fun. And mm -hmm. people would use it and they would get up and go to work next day and take care of their kids. Separate and apart from that, 
as long as we just keep punishing it, it distracts us from having real conversations about why people in West Virginia are addicts and why they use drugs. Mm -hmm. And we're never going to be able to get to those conversations while we're busy picking people up and throwing them in jail, which by the way, people in West Virginia are dying right now in the jails. Mm -hmm. The National Guard for 18 months were staffing our jails because there was a state of emergency. So we can either help these people that have an illness and a substance abuse disorder recover, Mm -hmm. or we can take them down to the jail where the military watches over them and increase penalties and increase overdoses. It's incredibly hard in West Virginia right now to open up a recovery center Mm -hmm. because of certificates of need and because Mm -hmm. West Virginia University Medicine, which is a state quasi Mm -hmm. state owned hospital has a lock on the market. And that then opens the door for me to talk to them about certificates of need. I talked to them about how You know, this idea that we teach our children that they have to leave West Virginia doesn't help because then the kids who don't have the opportunity to do that label themselves losers, label themselves people who are never going to amount to anything. So they say, well, I might as well stop. I might as well stay here in West Virginia. And I guess now, you know, I'm a loser Mm -hmm. and that leads to substance abuse. And we need to start talking about addressing that problem. But again, nobody cares about that problem when the Mm -hmm. answer is easy enough as throw them in jail. And then I start to point out to them, you don't really have a problem with the person that's using the drugs. Right. You have a problem with the fact that that person is stealing the bike out of your backyard and that's a crime. So the person Mm -hmm. should be in jail for that. You have a problem with the fact that that person is abusing or neglecting their child, Mm -hmm. which leads me to talk about this. What if drug use was like alcoholism? If you went to your boss and you said, I need to tell you something. I've been drinking too much at night and on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I need to apply for short-term disability or leave because I'm going to go to rehab. Your boss would say, oh my gosh, you're good for you, man. Good for you for realizing that you've been drinking and yeah, like here's the paperwork. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Good luck. But because we label it a crime, if you go to your boss and say, I need to talk to you. I've been using too much heroin. (laughs) It's, it's going to be a different conversation. You're not going to get a pat on the back and you're not going to say, call me when you're out. So people use it in the darkness, which is what results in them not keeping a job, not coming forward, not asking for help, which is why that child ends up being raised by their grandparents and being neglected Because Mm -hmm. that person can't be honest with anybody about the problem that they're having. And as long as we continue to make it a crime, and as long as we continue not talking about what's causing the problems as a society, it's it's very, very dangerous. That was an impressive answer. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. And I say that very honestly, because earlier you'd mentioned, hey, when I first ran, um, you know, it kind of taught me to be bold and unafraid to, you know, to talk to people. And you, you kind of, you said you kind of watered down the message in a sense, you know, more out of fear than anything. And I remember a long time ago being the same way when it came to drugs, right? Like it was just like, like marijuana, that was pretty easy. Most of my friends could get on board with that, but then they would be like, but even heroin. And I'm like, you know, but now, and and I'll, and I'll add just a very small addition to what you said, to complement what you said. If somebody were to go to the store after work and pick up their meth or whatever, um, like alcohol, you know, when I go when I go and buy a bottle of wine, it tells me what percentage of alcohol is in it, so I have an idea, mm-hmm. and I know that that percentage is pretty accurate. 
And I also know that since I'm buying it from a formal store, if it's tainted with something, I have recourse. I can go and say, hey, you sold me this bottle of wine and it was contaminated with something. You owe me for all my medical bills, right? And so I have recourse for that. Whereas right now, while it's in the dark, if somebody sells somebody, even marijuana that's laced, and you know maybe the you know there's some, it's laced with something and it, you know really harms them, there's no recourse because you can't go and to the judge and say, hey, this guy illegally sold me a drug, right? And it harmed me, and it wasn't supposed to because it was supposed to be just an afternoon of relaxation for myself, right? And so I think that's I you know just to complement your message, I think people don't realize what the difference would really be if it was in the store on the shelf. We know when we go get aspirin, how much of, you know, how much is in, you know, how much of the, uh, the active drug is in the aspirin. Um, same for all the other drugs and we have recourse, you know? So I think it's, I think it was a really good analogy also to point out the, um, the bathtub where there was bacteria, because I wouldn't have really thought of that. Um, but, but it's, it's a great point. Like, Hey, it's clean now. <laughs> you're not going to get regular sick and you're not going to get really, really sick either. So I, I do, I, I commend you. That was, that was a really phenomenal answer. Um, not that I wasn't expecting it. It just, uh, you know, it really caught me off guard because I haven't heard anybody really lay it out that simple and easy to understand. And so I really, really like that answer. Um, I know we're getting close to time and I want to respect, uh, you know, your evening. Um, so let's end on the most positive note that we possibly can. What has you the most excited about this race this year? I think what has me the most excited is, is really the possibility and the energy. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I wouldn't have imagined, you know, when I agreed to run, I, I'll be honest. It was, it was obligation, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Right. It's, it's the ballot access race. I'm a libertarian. Mm -hmm. It's important. Somebody has got to do it. I'm going to step up. Right. But the, the energy and the reception that I'm getting out there is, is just incredible. And I feel like, you know, even, even if I don't, get to where I want to be, even if we don't, you know, win, even if we don't hit the numbers that we want to, mm -hmm. I know that I'm making connections with people. I know, you know, I make sure that in addition to my campaign materials, I'm carrying around the, what is a libertarian card. And mm -hmm. I know how many of those I'm giving out. And I know that people are asking for them. So for me, what is the most exciting to me is just knowing that people more people than ever are fed up with the two party system. And I, I know we say that all the time, but this year there's something different about it, you know, and it, whether or not it's that we're doing, you know, um, the Trump versus Biden part two, mm -hmm. or whether or not it's just, you know, we make a little bit of progress every year. The, the sheer amount of people that are disgusted. You know, I had an event this weekend and it was a, a fundraiser at a restaurant and we had some signs around and this lady came over and just barged onto our private deck and she's like, I'm sorry, I'm from Pennsylvania. I can't vote for you, but I have to know what is a libertarian because I'm a Republican and I'm done. Tell, tell me who you are and and, right. and and what you mean. And just that excitement that I'm seeing from people and the amount of people that are saying, Thank you for giving me a third option. Thank you for bringing some sanity to the process. Thank you for bringing, you know, some, some standards to the people that are running for office. I'm just so excited this year that people are open and receptive to a third party and that people are as excited about a third party and a third option as I am. So I'm just, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm really excited to see and I think it's going to be great. I think we're going to do really well. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing those results. Uh, so final words for you, if you want, and then let people know how they can find you, how they can help you. Uh, we've got it scrolling at the, get my finger in the right spot here at the bottom. Uh, I, I should have separated it better, but Kalinich for WV.com. 
So go there. But how else can people find you, follow you, support your campaign? Sure. So I am on all of the social media platforms other than TikTok. I'm not that advanced yet. Mm -hmm. um, so if neither. you're if you're a TikToker and you want to help me with my campaign, you could reach out to me because I could use somebody to run TikTok. But I have a Facebook page. It's Erica Kalenich for Libertarian um, or Libertarian for Governor of West Virginia. And mm -hmm. you can find me there. I'm on Instagram at Erica Kalenich. I'm also on X at Erica Kalenich. Um, so you can find me on any of those things. And I always tell everybody, the reason I just go by my first name is um, on my logo, if you see it, is because my last name is really, really tricky. It's K-O-L-E-N-I-C-H. And if you just type in Google, Erica, Governor, West Virginia, all of my stuff comes up. So you can find awesome. me there. So you can message me. My email is E-R-I-K-A um, at Kolenich for WV.com. Um, I can use help in all kinds of ways. You know, people can donate to my campaign. You know, I'm one of those people, even $5 helps me out. If you have more, that's great. I can use help from afar, you know, texting, calling. So if you like to do those types of things, social media help, I can use all of those things. And sometimes just a, a kind word is also nice. So if you see what I'm doing or you see a video that you like, you know, just the, Hey, thanks. That a, that a kid go get them is, is nice right. as well. Awesome. Well, um, if you will just hang backstage really quickly while I close the show out. Um, and I will make sure to add all of those links in the show notes people. So you can see those. So hold tight for just a moment, Erica folks. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found it informative and inspiring. I want you to be sure to catch me Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern for an informed discussion on politics and culture. Make sure that you are following my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my Rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com or rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, let me know how I'm doing by leaving me a comment. Last but not least, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week, a great 4th of July. But for now, I'm out.